Hey guys, welcome to Relatable. Happy Thursday. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Good Ranchers. American meat delivered right to your front door. Go to goodranchers.com slash Allie. That's goodranchers.com slash Allie. All right, guys, I've got an episode for you today, a fiery episode. I just recorded an interview, a debate with Brandon J. Robertson. He is a progressive. He calls himself a progressive Christian, a pastor of Metanoia Church. He calls himself a public theologian. Now, you might know his name and you might know his face and voice if you listen to this podcast or if you watch some of my videos on Instagram, because I have reacted to a previous video that he did saying that Lazarus comes coming out of the tomb was Jesus calling gay people to come out of the closet. And so that's who we're talking to today. He is pro-choice. And so we are debating abortion. Um, now, I would call that pro-abortion. He refers to himself as pro-choice. And so we had a very intense, you guys know how passionate I am about this subject. And so it did get very intense at times, but I am very appreciative of Brandon being willing to come on because most people that we ask, that conservative shows in general, ask to debate, especially this subject, say no. He was very respectful. So guys, if you disagree with him, especially on YouTube, please leave respectful comments. There should be absolutely no ad hominem attacks. Um, be as respectful in your disagreement and your dialogue is possible. That's what we're looking for. We can be very passionate. You will hear in this conversation, I get extremely riled up about the arguments that were being made. Um, and that's fine. That's fine. But we should resist any kind of personal attacks because it's good that we have this kind of dialogue. Before we get into the conversation, I just want to address that a lot of you guys have been sending me messages over the past few days just with the ridiculous posts that your friends are sharing that you didn't even realize that your friends were pro-choice. You didn't realize that they supported abortion and the legal right to abortion. Um, and they have been posting about women's rights and how scary this is and how terrible this is over the past few days. And you have asked me several times to respond to the popular post that you are seeing circulated by Brene Brown, by Glennon Doyle, by several other even professing Christian influencers. Or you have pointed out that a lot of your favorite uh, female Christian influencers who are so quick to talk about social justice or police brutality, even alleged police brutality or what's happening at the border have nothing to say about abortion, even though they call themselves pro-life. And unfortunately, I have not been able to respond to every single argument out there, every single post that you guys have sent me and every single message over the past few days. This reminds me a lot of June of 2020, when a lot of your friends were posting things about race and police and social justice that were simply not backed up either by biblical theology or by facts and data. And uh, you guys were just asking me for help, for arguments, for clarity and, and, and sanity, because it kind of can feel like we're just going crazy when it feels like we are in the minority. Um, I just want to encourage you guys with a few things. And I posted this on Instagram and I'll say it again here. In every conversation that you have with someone, um, what you can do if you don't know what to say, if you've never heard that argument before, just bring it back to the baby. Bring it back to what an abortion is. Every story that you hear, every anecdote that you're offered, every argument, however nuanced and complex it is, bring it back to, but why is that a justification for killing a human being? Now, what you will often hear, and you'll hear that, I don't want to give too much away, but you'll hear a lot of this conversation in today's discussion. What is a human? When does life begin? Um, and look, science says conception. And so the question is, when does someone get rights? And if it's any time after conception, it becomes arbitrary, right? And arbitrary assignment of rights um, to certain groups of people based on the whims and desires of people in power have been the mark of every human rights atrocity from slavery to genocide for all of history. And so just go back to the baby, go back to this innocent human life that is being victimized, go back to what the abortion procedure entails, which we have discussed so much. I will link some of my most popular abortion episodes in the description of this show. Um, I've done, we've done so many, so many. So you can just look up relatable 
abortion, wherever you listen to your podcast or on YouTube, they will all come up. We have addressed pretty much every argument under the sun when it comes to abortion. And the second thing that I want to say um, for all of you who are dealing with these conversations and dialogue and debates and just anger maybe from some of your friends or family members who are on the other side of this, I just want to encourage you that you're doing a good job. I have gotten so many messages um, saying you know, because you listen to um, a relatable podcast or because we've talked about this so much, or maybe you've listened to other pro-life advocates for a long time, you have felt the courage in a lot of cases for the first time to speak up on behalf of unborn children, to speak up on behalf of this vulnerable class of people. And I just want to commend you for your courage. I just want to commend you for your boldness. And I want to tell you that even if the person's mind didn't change who you messaged, who you talked to, who you texted with, that does not negate the significance of your obedience. All right? That does not negate or minimize in any way the significance of your obedience. You have no idea what seed that you have planted. You have no idea what God is going to do with that conversation. You have no idea what other conversations that person is having, how God is working in their heart and their mind. I mean, think about all of us and the different ways that we have changed our minds on theological or moral things since we became a Christian. Like there are probably some faulty things that all of us believed a few years ago that we no longer believe. And it was a process. It was because of conversations. It was because of things we read. It was because of God working on our hearts. So understand that when you're having the conversations and the arguments that you that you're having, that your job is to be obedient. Your job is to say what is true. Your job is to speak the truth in love about what abortion is. And God is sovereign over that person. Like God is in charge of changing that person's heart and mind. Ultimately, you are just playing a role. Your job is to be obedient. Your job is to be clear. Your job is to be courageous. Your job is to speak up for the person that is completely forgotten when it comes to pro-abortion arguments. And that is the child that is being victimized, killed, slaughtered, dismembered because of abortion. If the church cannot stand up for this, if this is not an issue that the church can care about, that we can't be clear on, then we have completely dropped the ball. Because as we've talked about, since the inception of Christianity, we have been a refuge for the most vulnerable, namely children, who have, in a million different ways, been victims of child sacrifice and exploitation almost since the beginning of human history. The church has to stand against that including abortion. This is this is a biblical issue. This is a Genesis 1 issue that we are made in his image. As R.C. Sproul has said, and I've said many times, if he knows anything about God, it's that God hates abortion. And let me just say, before we get into the conversation, I always want to reiterate this. When I talk about just the wickedness and brutality of abortion, I just want to tell you that if you have had an abortion, if you are thinking about an abortion right now, don't do this alone. I know it might feel lonely. You feel like your shame is crushing you, your fear, your anxiety, whatever, your guilt that is just tearing you apart on the inside because you're thinking about this or have already done this. Listen, you are no worse than any other sinner on earth. All right? You are no less of a candidate for God's grace and forgiveness and mercy and compassion than anyone else. Ephesians 2 says we are all dead in sin apart from Christ. There are not different levels of dead. We are all dead in sin apart from Christ. If you have had an abortion and it is a secret that has been weighing on your heart, you need to go to a pro-life pregnancy center. You need to go to someone within your church. You need to go to a trusted Christian friend and tell them, Bring that to light. Let God heal you. Let God show you how good he is, how much he loves you, that he sent his son to die for that sin, to cover it up, to pay every single debt that we have, every single sin that we have committed. There is no sin too big, too secret, too dark, too grave that God cannot forgive, that Jesus's blood does not cover. There is hope for you and God can use your testimony, your life, as a testament to his grace and to help people and to show people who he is, what he's done for you, and to save the lives of other unborn children and to help women who are considering the same thing that you have done. And if you are a woman who is pregnant, you don't know how you're going to do it. Maybe you're considering an abortion. There are people to help you. 
I want you to go to your local pro-life pregnancy center. You can look up Pregnancy Resource Center in your area. I'll try to find a link that shows um, where these pregnancy resource centers um, exist. Message me if you can. I pray to God that I will see it and I will connect you to the right people. That would not be the first time that that has happened behind the scenes. There will be no shame or judgment in our conversation. I just want you to know that you are not alone. You are not alone alone and there are options for you um, and we will help you however we can um, and so I just want to make sure that we have that and look if you are someone who is pro-choice or you are someone who considers yourself pro-abortion or maybe personally pro-life or politically pro-abortion um, I hope that you will go back and listen to some abortion episodes that we've had or some or some of the conversation that we're about to have today and that you would reconsider your position and remember that these are people made in the image of God that we're talking about and we're talk, talking about legally murdering them. This is a matter of life and death and there's not really a question of which side Christians should be on. Of course, my guest today, he disagrees and we will get into that dis- fiery disagreement in a second, but I just kind of wanted to give some context and a precursor um, for all of that. Before we get into the conversation, um, let me tell you about our first sponsor for the day. And this is just in time for Mother's Day. If you are still scrambling to try to find something for your wife or for your mother, this is a great option. And that is GenuCell. Right now, they have this amazing deal on their ultra retinol cream. During the limited time Mother's Day sale, every eligible order includes GenuCell's immediate effects for results in as little as 12 hours, absolutely free. GenuCell Ultra Retinol is powered by GenuCell's proprietary MDL technology that combines the anti-aging effects of the meadow foam flower with the hyper-moisturizing effects of hyaluronic acid. GenuCell promises that you will look 5, 10, even 15 years younger, guaranteed or your money back, guys. That is an amazing promise. You really have nothing to lose. If it doesn't work for you or you don't like it, then you get your money back. Right now, join GenuCell's best in-class reward program at checkout for an extra 10% off your order. Go to genucell.com slash Ali now for up to 50% off world-class skincare. That's genucell.com slash Ali. Every order automatically upgraded to free two-day shipping with a concierge white glove service for a limited time. That's G-E-N-U-C-E-L.com slash Ali. genucell.com slash Ali. Brandon, thank you so much for joining us. And like I said, before the camera started rolling for being willing to dialogue across the aisle about this important subject. So first, I'm just going to open it up to you. If you could just briefly kind of summarize why you consider yourself pro-choice, why you believe that abortion should be a legal option for women. Yeah, I think abortion is a morally complex issue. And one thing that I always have said about abortion is that I don't know any progressive person that wants to see abortion increased. We all want to see it decreased. I think the the question is about how we do that. And so I believe that there are many instances in which women should have the right to access abortion care. There are many instances, uh, both from a faith perspective historically and from modern scientific perspective, when uh, about why women should have access to abortions. And so I think overturning Roe v. Wade is an attempt to completely ban abortion in many states across this country. And that's a net negative. That results in, um, we know statistically, um, women doing harm to themselves because they can't access uh, healthy abortions. You can't ban legal abortion, or you can't ban abortion, you can only ban legal abortions. And so my whole point is I want to see abortions made available And then through comprehensive sex education, through contraception, through other means, uh, we can work on reducing abortions together. But I think overturning Roe v. Wade and banning abortion altogether is just not an effective way to deal with this issue. Okay, so there's a lot in there that I want to address. First, I do think that it is incorrect to say that there is no one on the progressive side that believes that um, abortion is good. There was an article, a kind of infamous article, at least from my perspective, in New York Magazine, which is a very mainstream outlet in 2019, titled Abortion is a Moral Good. I've testified before Congress, and I heard the women next to me who consider themselves reproductive justice advocates who talk about not just that 
that abortion is a necessary evil, but that it is actually good for society. It is good for women, especially economically. There's an organization called Shout Your Abortion, which has been touted by people like Oprah that is trying to destigmatize abortion. So yes, there are many people on the progressive side that are not actually interested in reducing abortion. This whole trope of safe, legal, and rare, it might have been something that was popular in the Democratic Party 10, 15 years ago, even by the current president of the United States. That is not the current mission or the platform or the idea that is predominantly perpetuated on the left side. It is that abortion should be uh, accessible without apology for any reason through nine months and subsidized by the taxpayer. So let's start there. That is the current position of the Democratic Party, that abortion is not evil, that it doesn't necessarily need to be reduced, but that it just needs to be accessed and even free. So I disagree. Um, I think that what I think there are definitely extremes on both sides. I think there are extreme pro-life and pro-choice people that I, as a Christian minister, would disagree with. However, I do think the vast majority of Americans, the 70 percent that support the right to access abortion, want to see abortions decreased through these other means that I've named and that Democrats and progressives have been naming for many years. Um, And I do think, yeah, you're right. Sure. There are people on the extremes who want to just say, Abortions for everyone up to nine months, I think that is a minority position. And uh, I don't think you could find in the Democratic platform where that would be uh, explicitly endorsed by any mainstream uh, Democratic Party platform. I actually think it would be very different or it would be very difficult to find a mainstream Democrat who today would say, here's what I believe should be the limit on abortion. Really, what you hear is that, well, it should just be a choice. I mean, this is the legislation that we're seeing in California, that we're seeing in New Jersey, that we're seeing in Maryland. We are actually seeing the decriminalization of fatal negligence of babies even after they're born and if they survive an abortion. I mean, you saw the Born Alive Survivors Act that uh, Republicans in the Senate tried to pass a couple years ago, and no Democrats voted yes on it. This was simply saying that doctors should be required to provide life-saving care to babies who survived an abortion, okay? So that's not even limiting an abortion. No Democrat voted yes on that. So it is a mainstream extremist position on the left. I'm not saying you represent it, but it is a mainstream position on the left that there should be absolutely no limits to abortion. So I just think that you're wrong, that no progressives think that there should be, you know, no limits to abortion. That is the mainstream position today. Progressives. And of course, I'm not saying no progressives. I say by and large, most progressives how, that I know of would say that about 20 weeks is the general limit on when we would talk about uh, when an abortion can take place. And that's based on um, viability. That's based on what we know scientifically, viability of the fetus to be able to actually grow into a full born baby. So, OK, well, let's uh, wait. I, I want to hear more about that, because 24 weeks is, vi- is viability. Babies as young as 21 weeks have survived outside the womb. 24 weeks is actually viability where they have more than a 50 percent chance to survive outside the womb. So let's hear a little bit more about your reasoning. Why should abortion be allowed before 20 weeks, but not after? Well, simply because of viability, simply because they're not viable the- at 20 weeks. No, exactly. So the moral question here for me as a pastor is, when does life begin? And this is the question that Christians and people of all faith have been debating for thousands of years. In different traditions, there are different answers to this question. I think scientifically, we can say today up to 24 weeks is when a fetus becomes viable. So I think that time frame between 20 to 24 weeks is the time that we then can start talking about restrictions on abortion. I do think there are instances when the mother's life is uh, is at risk that we have to talk more broadly about this. This is where it gets morally complex. But I think abortion, like so many moral issues, we want to make this just black and white. It either is completely legal for everyone or it's completely banned for everyone. And I think these are highly individualized situations and it doesn't do good for our polarization. It doesn't do good for the health of anyone in our country when we simply make this black and white, in or out, good or bad, because it's not that simple. So human beings, we become human beings, technically, scientifically, at the moment of conception. That's when we have our unique DNA. Now, listen, what you are arguing is, and a lot of people have argued it, you're right, different traditions say different things. The argument is not whether a person is a a human is a human at conception. We have everything that we need and just need 
time uh, in order to develop into a baby that is able to survive outside the womb. We are all human beings at conception. The question is that you are bringing up is when does a human being become a person? When does a human being get rights? That is really the debate that you are raising. There is no question in embryology or biology when a human being is a human being. I mean, if you have ever seen a baby um, in a first trimester sonogram that's a baby that is a baby that's not just a blob that is a baby with um, not just a heart and a brain and ribs and lungs and fingers and toes moving and kicking and teeth that you can see and lungs that are developing i mean you see a fully formed human being at just 10 weeks gestation inside the womb and so why why do you say that that clearly human being that we can see why is that not a human? Who decided that? Why all of a sudden at 20 weeks gestation does that person become a human? Like when did that happen? And why do you have the authority to say that they're not a human before that? I've never claimed to have any authority uh, on this issue. I'm speaking from Apparently you do because you believe that people should be able to kill that human being before that. So why? It's not, because it's not a human being. I don't think he any says, modern... You have I don't think... Modern science would say that a just when a baby is conceived, that that is now a human being. That is a potential life. I will give you that. Language. It's alive. Say- if it's not alive, then the woman isn't pregnant. Then the woman has. Ha- what happens in a miscarriage if that human being is not alive in the womb? Viability is the standard by which we know a fetus can become a fully alive human being. They I are think fully that- alive. Have I know that you've never been pregnant. I know that the left is confused about whether men or women can actually carry a child. But that human being is alive. You can feel that baby kicking at 16 weeks. You can see the baby in the sonogram moving and kicking around. They can recognize their mother's voice before the time you say that they are an actual human being. Science does tell us they're a human being. You are saying that some human beings don't have rights. That is what modern science says. Yours is a superstitious philosophical position not a scientific one well i am primarily a pastor and theologian so yes i'm going to talk from a theological and philosophical perspective primarily okay give me the theological support for a baby all of a sudden becoming a human at 20 weeks the earliest jewish tradition in the hebrew bible says that uh, a person doesn't become a person until first breath now i reject that but here's the thing there is ancient tradition there is ancient religious tradition we would even say there's ancient judeo-christian tradition that has disagreed about when exactly life begins, and that is the complex moral question. So I think it's important to go with what the science actually says. I've never read any scientific report in all my studies of abortion over the past eight to 10 years that I've been talking about this topic that says uh, when a baby is conceived that that is a human being. I don't think any it is. Science- what else is it? Okay, okay, here, what, what else is it? If it's not a human being, is it a summer squash? Is it a turvis <laughs> tumbler? No, that, but that doesn't actually exist. We're not potential. Yes. We're not potential. That doesn't even make sense. Okay, tell me then what happens in a miscarriage. That's a potential human life that was ended. That's a, a horrible... A potential in- human life that was ended. Do you not hear that that doesn't make any sense? A potential it's human not- life can't exist because potential means it doesn't exist yet. Potential, it's, by definition, yeah. means that it does not exist yet. So a yeah, potential can. something cannot <laughs> end. It has to yes, exist for it to end. It has to live for it to die. That's a completely illogical argument. All right, second sponsor, you know them, you love them. It is Good Ranchers. You know what you need this summer. Maybe a new swimsuit, maybe a new pool or a new floaty. But in addition to those things, you need burgers for those summer cookouts. And I don't just mean any burgers. I am talking about American Wagyu burgers made from some of the best beef you've ever tasted in your life. I can attest to that. Good Ranchers American Wagyu is raised right here in the United States and produces the rich buttery texture that people who know their steaks crave. These burgers are individually wrapped so you can easily pull them out and cook them on the grill or in the skillet a skillet, or uh, you can use them for other meals too with meat prices so Soaring, inflation, out of control. I love that when you subscribe to Good Ranchers, you lock in your price and you get $25 off every box for life of your subscription. As long as you are subscribed, your price will not change. What an amazing deal as we are 
dealing with these unexpected, unpredictable price hikes. You get your price that you pay right now locked in forever. Two pounds of free Wagyu burgers and zero inflation. What are you waiting for? Go get both by using my code Allie or by visiting goodranchers.com slash Allie. If you don't buy the meat in your house, then tell the person who does to grab your two pounds of free American Wagyu burgers today before they're gone. Good Ranchers, that's American meat delivered. Potential okay, can be let's break always. it down. Let's break it down. Tell me it's how something that does not exist ceases to exist. I didn't say it doesn't exist. I said it has the potential to exist, and you can stop the potential of that life from becoming real. But it does. But it does exist, or else it can't die. I did. It's a, the potential ends. The potential for that fetus to become a fully. So when a woman being, is pregnant, she's not actually pregnant with anything. When she sees in the ultrasound a, at eight weeks that beating heart, a that's a potential. Potential what? Yeah. A potential, potential what? Life potential human life then then what is it at the time you can't if you see something if something tangibly exists this is not a potential this is not a, a potential microphone when this you, is an actual microphone when you put a seed in the ground is it a tree or is it a potential tree it is a potential tree this but is it's, how but listen it's not just a seed it's not just a seed that we're talking about we are talking yeah, about all of the cells all of the yeah. cells that are necessary to grow into a fully formed baby but it is a human being at conception you simply believe that it is okay to kill certain human beings because they're not big enough yet. That is the no. debate. There's no scientific debate about whether or not a human is a human at conception. The whole debate is whether or not that human being has rights. And you believe you, that human you beings, can, some human beings don't have rights. That's what you, you believe. Our mouth. But as a Christian, I think that what you're doing is unethical by jumping the gun and taking words that I'm not saying and making the words that sound good to your audience. A potential human life is a potential human life. I think scientifically, I stand with the majority of the science today. I'm very confident in that. And again, I'm not, my primary objective is to simply say, we want to see abortions reduced. And the way we're gonna do that is not by banning abortions. We can get into the technical conversation, but it's a complex moral conversation that's been going on in our country for a very long time. And there are not clear answers. I wanna talk about what is the best way to ensure that women stay healthy, to ensure that our country continues to move forward in a way that protects everyone, including the least vulnerable. And I don't think that is through banning and criminalizing abortion, which is what a number of these Republican states want to do if Roe v. Wade is overturned. And that will, we know statistically that that will um, cause great harm to women and that will cause great harm to many people across our country, disproportionately affecting communities of color and communities that are already disadvantaged in our society. Well, unfortunately, people of color are already disproportionately affected by abortion. In New York City, several years in a row, more black babies are were aborted than born. A highly disproportionate number of black babies are aborted every year. And of course, that goes back to the history and the origins of Planned Parenthood, which was started by a white supremacist eugenicist. It's carrying on that legacy today by disproportionately killing unborn children. And so if you want to talk about harm from our perspective, if you want to talk about harm, if you want to talk about danger, like we can talk about poisoning and dismembering and purposely start stopping the heartbeat of living human beings while they are in the womb. And if you just want to focus on uh, post viability abortions, unfortunately, that happens at least 10,000 times a year. These are brutal procedures, really, from conception onward. Abortion is a brutal, violent procedure of human beings that are made in the image of God. So if you want to talk about danger, if you want to talk about violence, if you want to talk about things that are harming, like let's talk about the abortion procedure which is killing people, which I just can't find in all of my study of scripture that the God who made us in our mother's womb fearfully and wonderfully and purposely with specificity, that the Jesus who invited the children to come to him, that the God who says in Jeremiah 1 that before he formed us in our womb that he knew us, I cannot find anywhere in Leviticus when God calls for the death penalty of the Israelites who were sacrificing their children to Molech I cannot find anywhere in scripture that that God 
who purposely creates us, who made us all in his image, who hates the shedding of innocent blood. I cannot find anywhere in scripture that there would be any justification for killing, for example, a 19 and a half week baby, but not a 20 week baby. That's arbitrary. And it has been that arbitrary assignment of personhood and rights has been the logical justification for every single dehumanization and genocide throughout history. There is no Nowhere in scripture that would do anything but condemn it. You're simply incorrect. Scientifically, we know up to the moment of viability that thing that you're calling a baby is not yet a baby. I fundamentally disagree It is a baby. There. It is and a baby. You have never, maybe one day when there is a scientific development where you can carry a child and you look at the sonogram and you see that child I, inside of you, I, it, there's no difference. There's no difference between a 19 and a half week baby and a 20 week baby. That is a human being that has been kicking the walls of your uterus for several weeks at that point. They don't suddenly become a baby that is a superstitious unscientific view that is not backed by embryology or any biological knowledge of fetal development at all you have given in to a dogmatic <laughs> superstitious view of human life it is arbitrary your view is arbitrary the leading the leading uh, organizations in our country like the cite CDC it, cite it for me and with us i have i can cite things for you uh we have let me pull up up to 23 weeks, the CDC says that is when the moment of viability is. Viability. <laughs> yes. Viability is not the same thing as humanity. And you just said yes. that you are for abortion uh, only until 20 weeks. 20 weeks isn't viability. So why? Because up to that point, it is just a potential human life. Why? At that why point, 20 weeks? Why 20 weeks? 20 weeks is not viability. So why? The CDC I, says 23 weeks. I, logically, that's when it becomes fully able. To live outside so not of the 20 womb. weeks babies at 20 weeks cannot live outside the womb so why are you saying that why are you I just, saying three weeks i just quoted 23 weeks from the cdc earlier which you is, said 20 so now we're okay, being a little well, bit more radical okay so now 23 weeks only when a baby can survive outside the womb and so people who, for example, outside of the womb, who are entirely dependent on a machine to live, who are not able to survive without the help of other people, are those people? Should we be able to legally murder them too? I'm just trying to figure out your definition or your standard of what humanity is because you haven't been able to cite the science on it. I have actually. You're bringing in external arguments to emotionalize this, which is the problem with this entire debate. Both no, it's called logic, and you haven't been able to support it. The CDC says that viability starts at 23 weeks, not humanity. Tell me, cite the scientific literature both, that says humanity starts at 23 weeks. Both extremes want to make this a hyper emotional argument. I'm not willing to do that. I believe this is a complex moral issue. I'm going to continue to stand with the million, millions of people, the majority of people in our country who believe that abortion should be able to be accessed in order to protect both the health of the mother and a lot of these, uh, a lot of abortions are taking place, their general health practices. This is to be for the well-being of the mother, for people. The point is, I think the emotionalization of this argument is not helping us in this country move forward in any way. I think if we overturn Roe versus Wade, I think we are going to see drastically negative consequences. We're going to see not abortion end. We're going to see legal abortion end. And that's going to result in people doing things that are going to harm themselves and be very unhealthy for them because they're going to find alternative means to get access to abortion. The way we decrease abortion is through increased sexual education, increased contraceptives, increased women's health. That is what we need to do. We've seen that over the past decade, we've seen abortions decrease under such policies. If we overturn Roe versus Wade, we can only expect that that abortion numbers are actually going to increase, just not in the legal ways. And it's going to put undue burden on women. This is not the best for our country. This is not the direction we should be heading. And I, that's why I'm opposing this action, this potential draft opinion by Justice Alito. Okay, let me pause for a second because they're telling me two things. That one, your phone is shaking a, or your ta your ta you might have like your hands on your table, so it might be shaking. Two, gotcha. Skype, because it does this, it is blocking. Like I can't hear you if you're interjecting on in what I'm saying. It's blocking it. Oh. So do you have headphones just so it doesn't uh -huh. seem like we're trying to silence you? It's okay, yeah. Pretend, uh... Give me 10 seconds. That's fine. Pulling in the old fashioned iPhone headphones. Let's see. Those are the best ones. So that's totally yeah. fine. Gotcha.
According to the Guttmacher Institute, which you probably know is a pro-choice, pro-abortion research institute, they actually say that they cannot find a causal relationship between some of the progressive policies that you're talking about and a reduction in abortion. Now, to be fair, they also say that they can't find a causal relationship between restrictions on abortion and reducing abortion. However, a lot of the time the argument is made that, okay, when Democrats are president, then you see abortion rates lower. So that must mean that Democratic policies are reducing abortions. For example, when Barack Obama was president, the abortion rate was lower than, I believe, when George W. Bush was president. However, if you look a little bit more closely at that, um, uh, presidents are not the ones that are making abortion policy. The state legislatures are making abortion policy. And when Barack Obama was president, Republicans dominated state legislatures and passed more anti-abortion bills than they had in all of history. And so, like, if you want to surmise that maybe there's a causal relationship between one thing and the abortion rate, you would have to look at the fact that the actual people who are making abortion policy, which is not the president, which is typically not the federal government, they're state governments, they were passing anti-abortion pro-life legislation while Barack Obama was president. So I just find um, this idea that, oh, we need all these progressive policies and then we'll reduce abortion. I understand the assumption that that would be the case, but I don't think there's very much, much research that is supporting that. In addition, even if we did have discussions about, okay, what policies can we put in place that will help women, that will help children, that will kind of take away the felt need of abortion. I still don't think that is a justification for taking away the rights of preborn children simply because they're defenseless, simply because they're not politically useful, simply because they're young or small or exist inside the womb. That's not a legal justification for killing anyone, including babies a, inside the womb. But you know that's a straw man. Nobody is saying that we're... we're People don't support abortion because we don't think these uh, potential lives are politically useful. My question for you is, are, do you support Roe v. Wade completely being overturned and abortion being banned, made illegal across the country in any, in any oh, form? Oh, so you don't. Oh, OK. So that is not what happens when Roe v. Wade is overturned. So no, but it is what's happening in a lot of these states that have but trigger laws. You just asked if I you just asked if I'm asking Roe you a v. Question. Wade is overturned and abortion is banned across the board. But that's not going to happen. That's not what overturning Roe v. Wade I'm does. I'm asking you what you believe. Simply, I'm asking you what you want brings, to see. Yes, I definitely no. want to see Roe v. Wade overturned. 100 no. percent. Do you, Roe v. Wade do you overturned. want to see abortion banned across the country? Yes or no? Yes, I believe that we should be able to legally recognize the rights of unborn children it's, because they're people just like anyone else. You're not 100%. answering the question. Should abortion be illegal across the country oh, I, under yes, all circumstances? Yes, yes, yes. I've already all said that. Um, yeah, abortion should be illegal because these are human beings. They're human beings. Yeah. And I you think believe, that's an insane policy. I think it's out of sync I with think almost insane. all Christian I theology. Think it's <laughs> insane to kill children simply because not, you have decided that at one week in gestation, completely arbitrarily, that they all of a sudden become human beings and all of a sudden become people with rights just because we say so. Yes, absolutely. All right, got to tell you guys about Annie's Kit Clubs. If you are looking for a way to keep your kids entertained while they are at home this summer, maybe it's too hot, they need to come inside, cool down a little bit, but you still want them to spend their time in a way that is productive and that is helping their creativity and critical thinking skills, you need to check out Annie's Kit Clubs. It's a subscription craft service. They ship different kinds of crafts to your front door every month. They've got woodworking, STEM projects, all kinds of fun stuff for your son or your daughter. Keeps the whole family engaged because they've got Annie's Creative Woman, uh, Woman's Club too. And uh, these hands-on monthly kits come with everything that you need, all the tools, all the supplies, all the instructions right there in the box. And now is a great time to try Annie's Kit Clubs because they are offering 75% off your first shipment. That's an amazing deal. All subscriptions are month to month. You can cancel at any time. Go to annieskitclubs.com slash Allie. Get your first month 75% off. That's annieskitclubs.com slash Allie for 75% off your first month. annieskitclubs.com slash Allie. Now, listen, I know a lot of people are saying, oh, well, this is going to ban the treatment of miscarriages. This is going to ban the treatment of ectopic pregnancies. This is going to stop women whose lives are at risk from receiving care. 
That's not true. In all of those situations, I understand a baby has to be removed. That is different than purposely stopping the heartbeat of and poisoning a child. I do understand that there are some complex questions and some hard decisions that have to be made if the physical life of a woman is truly at risk with the continuation of their pregnancy. Now, any time after viability, as we've already talked about, is 23 weeks, that baby has to be removed anyway, so that baby should be delivered, not purposely killed. The baby's coming out anyway. Now, before that, I do believe everything should be done to try to protect the life of both the mother and the child. If the baby sadly, tragically has to be removed, that's what has to happen. But we're talking about the intentional killing of a child. And I always think that that is wrong. I always think that that should be illegal. Yes, I've said yep. that many times, and, so I'm certainly not afraid to say that. And our, and our fundamental disagreement and the fundamental disagreement with my side of the aisle on this argument is that potential life is not life. And I think you're going to keep pushing back on that. And I think we fundamentally disagree. And I think we stand on the side of the science. And that's where this yeah, disagreement and I comes just down really to. I really want you to cite the science that says a human is not a human until 20 weeks. Because And cite it's, the science that says a viability, viability is the science. Viability is not humanity. Viability is not it the is. same thing as... No, it's not. No, it is I not. Because that, then, again, that, you could apply that outside of the womb. Viability means that they can survive without the help of the mother outside of the womb. There are plenty of people who cannot survive without the help of, for example, a machine. And so your standard is arbitrary. Your no, standard is arbitrary. Those are two very different things. How? Those are two how? very different tell things. Tell me, tell me how. People that need to survive with a machine is very different than an infant. We know the skin, the, the skin of a fetus before viability can barely survive being touched outside of the womb. Okay. It takes the chances of that potential life becoming an actual life are almost none. We know that to be true. They're Therefore, alive in the womb. What does it mean? when not, they, they are breathing. What is life? What does alive mean? What they, does alive mean? They're alive from the point of conception because again, no, otherwise a miscarriage not. or an abortion wouldn't do anything. No, you cannot logically explain how a yes, potential thing. No, you can't. You haven't been able to do it. How something yes. that potentially exists can then stop existing. If it potentially exists, potential then it never existence existed. is not existence. Then it exactly no, so true. it can't cease to it's exist. Growing. So a miscarriage that's and abortion. This is, is how nothing. biology works. No, it's I'm sorry that you're denying biology. Yes, when growth, <laughs> when anything grows biologically, it is a potential until it becomes becomes the full thing. We can use an argument that, as we did earlier, that is not quite as charged. Take any biological plant that is growing. As it's growing, it is not the full thing. A tree is not a tree until it's fully grown into a tree. It is a potential no, for listen, that. listen, there's a seed, there's a sapling. There are different stages of being a tree. They don't, it's never less of a tree. There are different stages of human life. There are different stages of an organism's development in the same way that um, a, an infant is not an adult. It's still a human being, but it, we call an infant a child in the same way that we call a fetus a baby. It's just a different stage of human development. Just so the ambiguity person, that's being highlighted. Just because a person is less developed does not mean that they are not as much of a human as someone who is more developed. That's basically your argument. And again, my argument is that, that it's not people, a human at all. It's the, not there's a human no at all. science backing that. I'm telling you, dude. There's no. There is science no science backing, backing your perspective yes, either. This is, is a no. There isn't. Okay, there is cite not. it. Cite it's, it, man. Cite, cite it. your science, man. <laughs> Tell cite me what it your... because every piece of embryology. No, the question is you not can't just say every baby... piece of embryology. The, you don't have question, any science to back your the question uh, perspective. is not when <laughs> human life begins. That is yes, not an it argument. Is. That the is the precise is question. Personhood. For pastors, the for theologians, it is about when life begins. No, that is the question are I'm just, interested in. You're avoiding that because you want to be pro-choice, because you want to be pro-abortion. I don't pro want to be pro-choice. I didn't start off saying I want to be pro-choice. I started off studying my tradition, studying scripture, talking to women in my congregation, and I arrived at this conclusion because of the science, because of my own philosophical reasoning and theological reasoning. This is what I believe is the right thing for our country. This is what I believe, based on all the evidence I've seen and read, this is the perspective I believe most helps the most people in our country that protects the rights of women. And that's where I'm going to stand. Okay. Well, I don't know if I'm going to be able to change your position. I still think that your position is extremely 
is extremely arbitrary, especially like I believe that it's conception. But of course, there are people who believe, OK, well, it's when the heart beats. And that's about 18 days after conception. There are some people believe that there it's when there's brain waves, which is about six weeks and two days after conception. There's independent all movement, arbitrary, eight right? to 10. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Oh, you make such a good point. It is all completely arbitrary unless you start when life actually with begins. viability. No, unless with you viability. start at conception, but not all babies are viable at 24 weeks. See, so it's arbitrary unless you start when life actually begins, which is conception. That's when we have separate DNA, distinct this DNA. That is when, by the way, gender is decided. XX or XY at the moment of conception. That's sex, not gender, but we can have another conversation oh, about yes, that. Oh, yes, we can. Uh, <laughs> can I just say one thing before, before this comes to an end? I think the one thing that I am most passionate about as a follower of Jesus Christ is that we need to be able to have the ability to have these conversations without demonizing the other side. And since posting my TikTok video on your feed asking for interviews yesterday, the vitriol from your side, and I acknowledge there's vitriol on my side, has been nonstop. This is not the way we're gonna move forward on this conversation. Demonizing each other is not the way we're gonna move forward on this conversation. People on my side aren't supporting uh, being pro-choice because we hate babies and we, uh, that's all that's demonizing that's untrue and we need to be able to have reasonable rational conversations not emotional conversations about this and then perhaps we can change each other's hearts and minds then perhaps we can actually make progress in this country and i think the demonization that takes place again on both sides is completely unhelpful and is preventing our nation from leaning in to the best values that we have and to actually making progress in whatever direction on these policies now, I would agree with you there, and I do, and I just want to tell anyone who is listening to this, watching this, I'm looking at you, YouTube commenters, because YouTube is a totally different field. It seems like that there should absolutely be no hate. There can be passionate disagreement, which I think is a great thing, but any kind of personal attacks is wrong and never something that I would support. Yes, I do see a lot. And I know we have our own perspectives and bias. Of course, from my perspective, I see like the vitriol yeah. and just threats to people's lives coming from the pro-choice side. When I posted the other day that the person who leaked the Roe v. Wade decision that they want to see um, the lives of conservative justices being threatened in their children because that's what's going to happen. What I got from blue check mark journalists, journalists were saying, good, they shouldn't have made this decision then. They shouldn't have done it. Good. I'm not saying there's no vitriol on the anti abortion side, but man, like you're talking yeah. about demonization. I am ta I am looking at threats to people's lives because they are pro life. That I agree with I you. Agree. That's that, a problem. That's indefensible. And I've gotten many tweets over the past day that says my mom should have aborted me Which because of my awful. perspective. It's awful. terrible. Yeah. So it's we need to stop that. We need to be able to have a reasonable conversation. And I do appreciate you willing to dialogue across the divide about this. So thank you. Well, for the record, I am glad that you are here. And I'm glad that your mom um, chose life. I I am glad that you are a person made in the image of God who I believe in as much as we disagree on theology and on the gospel. Um, you know, I believe that Jesus died for our sins and by grace through faith, we can be made alive through him. And um, gosh, I really do hope and pray that he changes your heart and your mind on this. Maybe not, but maybe we can have another conversation in the future about some more fundamental disagreements that we have because I enjoyed it. Well, likewise. Again, thank you. Thank you. And I'm grateful for the opportunity. Thanks very much. Have a good day. You too. Peace. Okay, I'm super excited to tell you about a new sponsor that I have that we have just been loving in our home, and that is Kami Koto Knives. Using traditional techniques, Kami Koto crafts beautiful knives using steel sourced from Japan. Each blade is made with techniques that have been honed and perfected by generations of knife smiths. They come in a beautiful, heavy duty ash wood box. Every blade is individually inspected and comes with a lifetime guarantee. We were so excited when these showed up at our front door. We have been using them for the past couple of weeks and I mean this when I say these are the best knives that we've ever had. We got good knives for our wedding. A lot of people register for that. If you are registering for your wedding right now, then these are the knives. Well, I don't know exactly if you can register for them, but you should ask. You should ask for these knives, Kami Koto knives. This would be a great wedding present for someone 
else. Um, if you're going to weddings this summer, these are super effective with a really sharp edge. They last forever. And I just love having them. And really, they come in this beautiful box too. This would make a great gift, maybe for your husband, for Father's Day too. All kinds of possibilities. If you go ahead and buy now, Kami Koto is offering you an extra $50 off site-wide. On top of their special offers, go to kamikoto.com and use the offer code Allie for an extra $50 off. That's K-A-M-I-K-O-T-O dot com slash Allie. That's K-A-M-I-K-O-T-O dot com slash Allie. All right, guys, I told you it was going to be a fiery, a fiery conversation. Um, again, I appreciate him coming on and I hope that you appreciated that conversation. Maybe I will have him back. We've got some very fundamental disagreements about the Bible. For example, he doesn't believe that the Bible is the word of God. I would say that that is a very fundamental disagreement that we have. Um, and so it would be really interesting to have him back on. As I said in the beginning, it's rare to have a progressive willing to debate these issues uh, with a conservative. And so maybe this can be some kind of series that we have. Um, and I appreciate you guys listening as well. Um, I just kind of want to reiterate because, you know, I wasn't expecting that we would kind of get stuck on the when life begins. I kind of just he has made the argument in the past that. God has given people autonomy, women autonomy over their bodies, and that that is sacred and they get to decide what to do with their bodies. And so I kind of thought we would get more into that and we didn't. What I would say to that argument is that your autonomy, your liberty, your rights, your choices end where another person's right to life begins. And so there are a lot of things that you have autonomy over as a human being. There are a lot of things that you can do with your body. You can do anything with your body, but you can't use your body to punch me. That's assault. And you will get in trouble because of that. And so we understand this principle that your autonomy has limits depending on how it infringes upon the rights, not just the desires, but the rights of someone else. Um, and so we didn't get into that argument, but that's what I would say to that. Again, once again, it's that principle of bringing it back to the humanity of the life of the child and reminding people what abortion actually is. And by the way, again, open an embryology textbook, you will find when human life begins. I personally still think he is confused about what the debate is actually over. The debate is over personhood. Um, if that's a philosophical debate, not a scientific debate over when humanity begins. And as you saw, he was unable or unwilling to answer that um, as appreciative as I am of his uh, willingness to at least try and, and talk to me about it. Um, I do just want to end. I thought John Piper has given really good, just a 10 solid reasons why abortion is wrong. And um, I appreciate his insight into a lot of these subjects, in particular um, abortion. Um, so 10 reasons why it is wrong to take the life of unborn children. Number one, God commanded thou shalt not murder, Exodus 20, 13. Two, the destruction of conceived human life, whether embryonic, fetal, or viable, is an assault on the unique person-forming work of God. Three, aborting unborn humans falls under the repeated biblical ban against shedding innocent blood. And I didn't see a reference there, but I did write it down. Um, and the command that he is talking about there is Jeremiah 22, 16 through 17. But you have eyes and heart only for your dishonest gain. God is judging Judah here for shedding innocent blood and for practicing oppression and violence. And so this absolutely goes under the category of oppression and violence. The Bible frequently expresses the high priority, number four, God puts on the protection and provision and vindication of the weakest and most helpless and most victimized members of the community. Certainly the most helpless members of our community are these babies inside the womb. And I also wanted to get into with Brandon what an abortion procedure at 20 weeks, 21 weeks, pre-viability, 22 weeks, um, what that entails and how violent it is and how that squirming, moving baby is brutally killed at that point in gestation. I mean, there's just no question of whether or not this is evil. Um, number five, John Piper says, by judging difficult and even tragic human life as a worse evil than taking life, 
Abortionists contradict the widespread biblical teaching that God loves to show his gracious power through suffering and not just by helping people avoid suffering. So he is speaking to that point that you often hear on the pro-choice side, well, that their life might be hard or that they might be unwanted or they might end up in foster care or they might be poor or whatever justification that they give. And he is saying that avoiding suffering in life is um, is not the goal. It, it, it's not the goal and it's not a justification for killing someone. And he points out that God's mercy can work through a person's hardship and suffering. It's not an excuse to kill someone. Number six, this goes along with that. It is a sin of presumption, John Piper says, to justify abortion by taking comfort in the fact that all these little children will go to heaven or even be given full adult life in the resurrection. That's also what you hear, that these souls are just going back to God. So what's the problem with it? Well, you could argue then, then why don't you just murder everyone who is, um, oh, that would be the justification for murdering anyone who you believe is going to heaven outside of the womb too. So that doesn't really hold up. Number seven, John Piper says, the Bible commands us to rescue our neighbor who is being uh, unjustly led away to death. Number eight, aborting unborn children falls under Jesus's rebuke of those who spurn children as inconvenient and unworthy of the Savior's attention. He is referring to Matthew 19 there. And I can and I can read that passage. Um, then children were brought to him, Jesus, that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people, but Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and went away. Um, number nine, it is the right of God, the maker to give and to take human life. It is not our individual right to make this choice. Now, I would say that there's a caveat here for the justification of the death penalty in cases of murder, but I am supposing probably that John Piper is talking about innocent life here. Number 10, finally, saving faith in Jesus Christ brings forgiveness of sins and cleansing of conscience and help through life and hope for eternity. Surrounded by such omnipotent love, every follower of Jesus is free from the greed and fear that might lure a person to forsake these truths in order to gain money or avoid reproach. So I think that those are 10 really good reasons. There's probably a hundred more, but it all comes down to the fact that human beings from conception onward are made in the image of God and therefore it is murder and therefore a sin to murder them. And if there is anything, if there is anything that a government should do, if there is any job that a government has, even the most limited libertarian government, it is to protect the um, the innocent person. It is to protect the innocent human being. It is to protect their right, the most fundamental right, not to be murdered inside the womb. Um, so I'm proud of you guys. Again, I just want to reiterate that. Keep on being bold. Courage begets courage. Politics matter because people matter. Raise a respectful ruckus. This is your, this is the hill. Like if you want one hill, of course, in addition to the hill, the gospel, if you want one hill to fight on, let this be it. It's a matter of life and death. You're doing good work. Keep being bold. Keep being courageous. P keep being obedient. Um, we will be back here on, on Monday. Who the heck knows what we're going to end up talking about. We have rearranged a lot of stuff this week to continue talking about this important subject. And I truly thank God for the opportunities that I've had over the past couple of weeks to talk about um, to talk about this. I have thankfully, I've had three media interviews and I had a speech that I gave just yesterday and I got to talk about this in every single situation and I'm just, and on here, of course, and I'm just thankful for the platform. I'm thankful for the ability to talk about it and I just praise the Lord for not just giving me a voice, but giving all of you a voice too. We're in this together and I am so glad to partner with you in trying to protect the most vulnerable. Our fight is worth it and expect pushback, but the pushback is worth it too. So thank you guys so much for listening and for being here. We will be back here on Monday. 